G'day everyone and welcome to Sci-Fi Weekly. Happy New Year. Happy New Year everyone. We are looking forward to a really big year this year with making Australia's first Science Fiction Weekly podcast. Absolutely Amber. For the month of January I've dived into the archives and found four interviews from the very beginning of the refreshed site uh, which was way back in 2013 um, when I celebrated 10 years of running, running the site which was a pretty big milestone. Amazing. But first up though, we're chatting with noted Trek author Larry Nemechek about those we've lost in 2015. Absolutely Amber, it was a, it was a pretty uh, devastating year uh, from in terms of the original Star Trek franchise. We lost Leonard Nimoy, uh, Harve Bennett, one of the producers from the movies, uh, and also Maurice Hurley from Next Generation, uh, not to mention of course Christopher Lee um, and so many other people. But uh, Larry and I had a chat uh, middle of last year about those that had passed. <laughs> Larry, it's uh, certainly been a rough couple of weeks. Thanks for joining me. Uh, yes, it's been a rough, uh, well, over a week here now, um, both as fans and as people who are concerned that, uh, you know, people's legacies move on in the Star Trek world and in the, in the pop culture world, as we saw the reaction to Leonard Nimoy's passing, you know. I mean, the, the NASA reaction was not a surprise because Star Trek and NASA have always had a mutually beneficent love affair uh, because they're both about the same thing, only on different sides of the coin. But uh, the mainstream, uh, you know, President Obama is, we widely know he's the first uh, president tracker, a Trekkie. Uh, but uh, it just shows you the length and breadth of, of, of where Star Trek has affected more and more of the culture as we've gone along down the road. So, uh, you know. Um, and then to have Harv lost uh, this last week, or at least get the word that he that he had passed away, um, was just adding adding more to it, and, and and set us all off on a lot of reflection. I think I've got a few friends that that aren't massive Trekkies, um, mm -hmm. so they they're not as affected by Maurice's and Harv's passing, um, but it's they, they were very much. A part of Star Trek, and without them, Trek as we know it wouldn't wouldn't be what it is, would it? Well, right. Well, certainly with with uh, Leonard, because after you know after Gene creating the character, you'd have to say that it's and and Spock being there even from the cage, you know, in his younger Yelly self. <laughs> uh, but you know, as it evolved and through the early episodes and Naked Time kind of being an early key one, and and then what Dorothy Fontana as a writer did for Spock too in the mix. Uh, but yeah, Leonard obviously leading the way and creating a lot of, uh, you know, even more so than what was originally figured because the show was set up to be a, uh, you know, a lead, second banana and a bunch of other people. And first Leonard bursts out of the box to be almost, a, well, to be a co-star with Kirk. And, and that first year, that was a little bit of friction as they got it sorted and the agents and the actors and everybody got their their mindset adjusted. And, and, then, and then, you know, D. Kelly managed to make, Dr. McCoy, such an integral part of the show, and you come up with the triad, where it's like the, the what do they say, the the head and the heart, and then and then the soul or the or the action man or whatever, you know, however you want to break Star Trek down, the popularity, and analyze it. But um, so yeah, but that's been a comfortable fit for all the years and all through the movies. You know, Leonard wishing he was not saddled with Spock, loving Spock, but wanting to be more than just Spock with his life, and then doing that. You know, Three Men and a Baby, Equus, all the show, other movies he directed, the, the projects he did, his photography, and feeling comfortable enough in his own skin to where he really could embrace, he could double down on embracing Spock and enjoying the fans and enjoying Shatner and Dee and kidding around. Watching a mock time, and it goes back to what you just said, that they, they settled down into these roles and, and they became, it really seemed that that was the episode where there were the three of them, and it was Kirk, Spock, and McCoy that mm -hmm. we know today, and that carried through all the way through to generations. It was always the three of yeah, them. Yeah, it was. It was. It was rapidly settling into that, and a lot of that was Gene Kuhn being involved, also as well as Dorothy Fontana, but uh, who died in 1973 and wasn't around to see any of the future glory that Star Trek became, much less how the franchise grew into all the movies and the spin-off series, the sequel series. But you, even the end of the first season there when you had uh, – uh, even though they were split up, but they were kind of feeling triad with City on the Edge of Forever. And even Operation Annihilate, they're working as a, as a trio there. So, uh, yeah, that was that, – the seeds of that were very much coming to fruition. And, they, and by then they knew that not only – you know, well, 
There was a time there when uh, Leonard's manager was holding out for more money, think, saying, look how popular he is. The, the fan mail is out through the roof. The fan reaction is incredible. You know, Shatner was the lead of the show, and there was a little bit of a mindset change, as there would be with any actor who was excited to be the lead of a show and have a breakout in the cast sharing time with that. But there was room under the guidance of how they would sketch out the characters. There's only one captain, and that, and then, and then, and then everybody loved D so much, and the fit for McCoy was such a natural fit in what he and Leonard had in the, the Spot McCoy banner. Um, was just, and how early on in a muck time they write the scene where you think it's going to be Kirk and Spock again and he says I want McCoy to accompany me and he says I would be honored sir like right there you know you hate to call it a duel because they're really you know they're they're like wonderful battling friends that love you know arguing of the bar bet or whatever kind of that's why I I really love the second season is kind of the mature I call it the mature season before Things got a little cheap and under the gun with the third season, and and things were still raw and exciting in the first, but they weren't quite as mature as characters and as a concept as it got to be. That set the mold for Star Trek um, throughout the four series that would come. It was it would always be it wouldn't just be the captain and his subordinates. It'd always be the captain, the first officer, and sometimes. Another one in TNG, it was Data in, in DS9, right. you're going to stretch me here, but well, <laughs> so on and so forth. It, it, it became this thing and that was right. the formula of Star Trek and, and I think that that's what made it so good was that it was storylines but it was also um, yeah. relationships. The brilliant thing about Next Gen was that it busted the universe open where it's still Star Trek and they still have those shared elements but now you're in a different corner of the Gene Roddenberry Star Trek sandbox. Maury Hurley did give us, looked around and saw how cyborg sci-fi was, you know, where, where Blade Runner and a lot of that had gone um, and uh, came up with the Borg. He, and he, we will always have Maury Hurley to thank for that. He really was the father of the Borg. You know, and we look at it now as fans and, and we, we will completely psychoanalyse uh, the intricate workings of that episode and how it played out. And if that episode wasn't actually there, would they have met him and would it have been the best of both worlds and so on and so forth. And I think that that's, that all just comes back to Maurice. He, he wrote that episode and he wrote 11 other episodes in, in Next Gen's first couple of seasons. And, um, and he's... Well, and you know, everybody, when people start looking at credits, remember that when you're the showrunner, you're doing rewrites on almost every script, probably. So really it was Maurice that, that created Next Gen and sort of steered it in, in the direction, even though season three is sort of where it found its feet and that's purely just by having well, so many characters, you know, uh, it takes time yeah. to establish them all and everything else. That's true, that's true. And like Denise Crosby didn't think it was gonna happen and she left the show because of that. She loved the show, but she's like, you're never gonna have time to develop my character. But yeah, you know, Maury Hurley did. They stabilized the writing staff a lot, pretty much. Had some, you know, Measure of a Man had some great shows in there. But I, I want to say that it was really, it was really Michael Pillar that came in and gave it the family feel. Because before that, it was kind of like the show of the week, and there wasn't a lot of continuity from show to show. Not continuity, but I mean, there wasn't a lot of follow through. And finally, Larry, um, let's chat uh, about Harve Bennett. The he came on board uh, producing from Star Trek Two and and uh, worked through to Star Trek Five. And what are your thoughts on Harve? He's the one that got hired in because no one was. Ha I mean, the motion picture made a lot of money. Paramount had charged all the development of the on again, off again series, little movie, back to a series. You know, all the development money they were building sets. They had commissioned scripts. They had hired. You know, director Bob Goodwin, um, John Povel was a story editor. They were staffing up to do the series, and they'd spent a lot of money, and all that cost got dumped on the first movie. So it made a ton of money because that was 10 years of fandom's main objective was to see a revival of Star Trek. And, you know, it was people were thrilled to see it, but there was still something. Everybody knew there was something a little off. So Charles Bloodhorn, who was head of Gulf and Western that owned Paramount then, Call is looking around for someone to do a Star Trek movie, but way pulling way back on the financials, you know, and doing it for much more, much more modestly. Plus, they had sets, you know, they had a lot of assets now, and the famous story of him coming in for the meeting uh, and saying, uh, "Did you see Star Trek: The Motion Picture?" Yes. Well, my little girl fell asleep in Act Three, you know, like a lot of people did. 
uh, do you think you could do it for cheaper than 45 million? And he says, Mr. Bloodhorn, I could do f four movies for 45 million. So he says, fine, go do it. But it's, it's, it's Har Bennett that sat down and watched all the original episodes who, who you know, had not been a big fan. He was busy doing TV. Uh, who decided that of all those, that that con character was just left hanging, and that would be wonderful to go back and look at with a time factor, you know, because it had been 10 years. So it's Hard Bennett that came up with the idea to redo con and go back and revisit that. It's Hard Bennett that found Nick Meyer based on 7% solution that he'd written and then directed. So, uh, you know, Hard Bennett and Nick Meyer are the heart of what the, me the biggest bulk of the original series movies and how they built and became more and more popular. Star Trek IV is the biggest mainstream movie. 20th anniversary, the studio's thrilled. They decide after the stations are screaming locally for more episodes that it's time to bring back a TV series. And then they come up with the idea to go, don't recast, go 80 years in the future and keep it going. So that was a pivotal year, 86. So you, you go back and I know I have, I have four or five people that I say save Star Trek along the way. You might even argue that Gene Kuhn saved burned out Gene, you know, gave him a boost right when it was needed right out of the gate and i'll and i'll hang my hat on michael pillar anytime for coming in the third season and 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 really sending next generation into the stratosphere and leading everything that came later we need to remember and and nick meyer said himself that harv bennett's i i always took that for granted and i always would plug harv and talk about him but the last 10 20 years he hasn't been around to talk really in the spotlight to talk for himself so i appreciated what nick meyer said when he sent his quote to uh, the trades, that it's what something I've always said. My soapbox has always been that that we would not have had modern Star Trek without Hard Bennett. It was pretty unfair in 2015 because not only did they take Spock from us, they also took Count Dooku. And many other great roles that Christopher Lee uh, had performed. Obviously, we do um, remember those that have passed, but we look forward to the future and the legacy that they left. Hello. I'm Leonard Nimoy. The following tale of alien encounters is true, and by true, I mean false. When he passed, I watched those three cameos that he had in uh, The Simpsons, uh, the monorail, uh, the one where... But you didn't do anything, didn't I? <laughs> Does somebody want to swap sweets? Absolutely love The Simpsons. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, our website is live at sci-fiweekly.trekzone.org and coming soon to iTunes. I will get that very, very shortly. Eventually. <laughs> Like, follow and subscribe to us on Twitter, Facebook and Vimeo. We're back in a week with three more interviews from the archives. It is the holiday season, sorry for the clip show. Including Matt's chat with the son of Star Trek creator, Gene Roddenberry. That was an awesome chat. Can't wait to see it again. I'm Matt Miller, she's Amber O'Reilly, we are Sci-Fi Weekly.